going to talk about an idea a little bit further out, Robert Lussard's concept for a fusion ramjet for interstellar flight. And I should start out by saying that there's a poster presentation by Al Jackson and Peter uh, Schatzmeider, uh, the interstellar ramjet and engineering nightmare, which covers some of the engineering issues that I was just going to gloss over. So I'd urge everybody to go check out the poster uh, and go talk to Al if you have questions on uh, his end. Uh, next slide. The Bussard ramjet is of course beloved of science fiction writers. The whole difficulty of interstellar flight, uh, next slide please, is that uh, to achieve interstellar flight in a time shorter than centuries needs velocities of a significant fraction of the speed of light. But of course, rockets require an amount of reaction mass that's exponential in the speed divided by the exhaust speed. Next slide, please. Uh, well, what's the solution? Well, for 50 years, fusion has been the energy source of the, of the future. And often people add, and always will be. But if we're looking for a power source that's energetic enough for interstellar flight, uh, fusion is the obvious choice. Here is the easiest of the fusion reactions to ignite. Uh, click, please. Uh, perfect fusion would give you an exhaust velocity of about 8.7% of the speed of light. Uh, with the caveat, that's if everything were perfect. Uh, well, there's a lot of problems with this. Uh, one is actually that it takes tritium. Uh, tritium is radioactive and it's a half-life of 13 years. Uh, second, notice that neutron coming out. Well, the neutron actually carries most of the energy, but neutrons can't be directed by electromagnetic fields. Next slide. So uh, it could work, but it's slow. Uh, next slide. With a velocity of 8% of the speed of light, you might get interstellar flight. A mass ratio of 100 would give you 40% of the speed of light. That would mean 99 tons of fuel for each ton of spacecraft weight. Uh, unfortunately, if you want to stop, you have to square that mass ratio. That's a mass ratio of 10,000. And that's if the conversion were perfect. All of the energy of the fusion goes into uh, the exhaust. And the worst problem, we don't even know how to do controlled fusion. Well, so turns out though, next slide, as I talked about in the previous slide, space is not actually empty. It's very close to empty, but it contains interstellar hydrogen, also in fact, interstellar dust, interstellar rocks. Next slide. So in 1960, Bob Broussard asked, do we actually need to carry that reaction mass? Why don't we just use that interstellar hydrogen in the interstellar medium, scoop it up and use it? for fuel. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this in principle was a rocket that could accelerate forever because it doesn't carry fuel. It scoops it up and the faster it goes, the more it scoops up. Uh, I'll add a spoiler here. Even though the fuel is free, no, you can't keep accelerating forever. Sorry, science fiction writers. Uh, and special apologies to Paul Anderson. The faster you go, the more stress on the scoop, and eventually the limit of material strength sets an upper limit. Uh, which brings us to an important point. Next slide. The scoop that gathers the interstellar hydrogen can't be a physical object like this artist's conception. It has to be many kilometers across, and any physical material would be far too heavy. The proposed scoops, next slide, would be electromagnetic fields. Uh, so models like this have to be considered just conceptual ideas. The main part of the scoop would be invisible electromagnetic fields. Next slide. It would look perhaps something like this, where the wires are used to produce the current and the charges that make the electric and magnetic fields that channel the ions and bring it into the center to the scoop. Well, what's wrong with that? Next slide. Uh, I showed you this slide before. This is how much hydrogen there actually is in the region around the sun. At the time that Boussard wrote his paper, 
a best guess for the density of interstellar hydrogen was one to two atoms per cubic centimeter. Uh, most of his calculations are scaled to scoop mass divided by hydrogen density. And he only gave an example calculation at the end of his article where he gave his actual assumptions. For his calculation, he assumed 1,000 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, that is, he was using as an example a ship flying through an interstellar hydrogen cloud. The real numbers turn out to be a lot worse. Depending on which direction we go, the density, hence the acceleration, is either an order of magnitude worse or one to three orders of magnitude worse, and an astonishing four to six orders of magnitude worse than the numbers assumed in his uh, example. Uh, next slide. So fuel actually turns out to be the least important of the problems of the multiple problems. Uh, next slide. The technical problems can basically be categorized, next slide, into three categories. I talked about the interstellar hydrogen, less dense than Boussard assumed, uh, next slide. Uh, the next problem is that there's no known or projected fusion method that uses hydrogen, just protons as fuel, and that's what you get uh, in interstellar space. Uh, at the center of the sun, we do get proton-proton fusion. I will mention that is at a temperature that gives you thermal x-rays at about 10 to the 20th watts per square meter, and you can't allow any of that energy to escape. But in fact, uh, the idea didn't actually work at all. The idea that you can scoop up interstellar hydrogen uh, was not really more than Bussard's uh, thought experiment. Uh, next slide. Let's see, where am I going next? Uh, the next problem is that the fusion must occur in milliseconds as the atoms pass through the scope, the throat. Uh, that's because uh, you're collecting charged particles. You can't collect the uncharged ones. So when you accelerate charged particles, they emit Bremsstrahlung. So you can't slow them down. If you slow them down, you emit more radiation than you're going to get, and you end up producing a parachute and not a electromagnetic scoop. Turns out, actually, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, Ader and Zubrin said, well, let's use that as a parachute. Stopping is also a uh, real problem here, uh, but that's not the problem of the Bussard ramjet. Uh, next slide. Well, I've told you three of the many, many reasons that it won't work. So let's now start talking about how do you make it work? Well, actually Singer and several uh, later authors uh, said, well, wait, instead of carrying the fuel, why don't we just put the fuel in the path? So we don't scoop up the ambient hydrogen, but let's put the fuel on a runway of fuel pellets by a dedicated craft that just goes and drops fuel behind it at predetermined locations. Each one has the fuel and locator be beacons, and maybe they have a tiny amount of propulsion to station keep in the predetermined location, or, uh, or maybe not. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe the ship just finds them wherever they are. Uh, the late Jordan Kerr, however, sketched out an even better idea. Uh, next slide. He came up with an idea that he called the Boussard buzz bomb. So instead of using the interstellar medium, as Boussard proposed, the fuels deliberately are placed in the path of the spacecraft, uh, as Singer suggested. And uh, each fuel has the locator uh, beacons, and we ingest the uh, we ingest the pellets with the interstellar probe. Next slide, please. Uh, so then his addition to this concept was to use impact fusion. So he pointed out that the speeds we're going, if we're going to do interstellar flight, nuclear fusion is achieved just at the temperatures produced by impacting two things together. So if a small pellet carried on the vehicle impacts a pellet of fusion, the impact releases enough energy to ignite that fusion reaction producing a large amount of energy. As he pointed out, if you have a trail 
of these pellets and each one gives you a bang. As you go through that trail of pellets, you're doing a series of successive micro explosions, uh, really literally buzz bomb propulsion. Uh, next slide. There's a number of basic problems here. Uh, there's some really hard engineering issues with the fact that at hundreds of kilometers per second, you're going to hit something with an accuracy of possibly fractions of a centimeter, but that's just an engineering problem. I trust the engineers, they can solve things like that. Uh, here are the things we need to know. What is that actual impact fusion threshold? What fuel do we use and how do you start it since you can't get fusion until you're already moving at velocities far higher than you can get to with conventional rockets. Uh, next slide. Well, let's start with that question, what's that impact fusion threshold? Uh, in his back of the envelope calculations, Jordan said, oh, you can get impact fusion at about 200 kilometers per second. Turns out doing a literature search that was quite optimistic. Uh, that was assuming the fusion particles are already compressed, uh, perhaps by laser beams. Uh, looking at particles that are not compressed, the target temperature for DT fusion, again, that's the easiest fusion to get, says that you need a thermalized plasma at about four kiloelectron volts per particle. That turns out to be a little bit under 700 kilometers uh, per second. Uh, next slide. So instead, we might want to use a different reaction. How about the proton boron 11 reaction or a neutronic uh, fusion? Next slide. Well, why pick that one? Uh, DT is the easiest reaction to ignite. Uh, boron has a charge 11 times that of a proton. So the Coulomb uh, ignition barrier is six times higher. So why do something that's six times harder to ignite but has lower energy per unit mass? Well, the first answer is that all of the reaction particles products are now charged particles. So magnetic nozzles work. Uh, but a second thing is that the fuel can be diborane. Next slide. Uh, diborane has the wonderful advantage uh, that it's a liquid at a very slight pressure. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's the reaction. Proton plus boron splits the boron into three helium neutrons, giving you three point, uh, sorry, giving you 8.7 MeV. Uh, the exhaust is charged, allows it to be confined uh, and directed. Next slide. Uh, well, we can do that calculation, but it turns out, I said it's harder to ignite, but it's harder to ignite thermally. Turns out to be not much harder to ignite by impact fusion because the boron has a charge of plus five, a five times higher Coulomb barrier, but it's 11 times more massive than hydrogen. So the boron atoms carry 11 times more energy than hydrogen at the same velocity. That means that the impact fusion threshold is very similar to the DT impact uh, fusion threshold. In fact, my back of the envelope calculation is maybe a 20% higher velocity. So more like 700 uh, kilometers per second rather than 600. Well, next slide. Look at the calculation of energy. Here's the energy uh, release. This is the mass. Use E equals mcc squared. Next slide. Uh, so here's the reaction. You're converting about one tenth of 1% of the rest mass into energy uh, by using the exhaust velocity formula. Okay, we're getting an exhaust velocity of 4.5% of the speed of light. Not too bad. Uh, move on to the next one. Of course, that's if everything's perfect. Uh, okay, so we have a fuel. We know what speed we need. How do we get that? Uh, Kerr proposed that we just start it using electromagnetic acceleration, uh, essentially a rail gun of the pellets. That's pretty hard to do. Uh, in fact, I think Andrew Higgins is uh, at the conference. Uh, he did an analysis of electromagnetic accelerators. I'll defer to him to go into the technical details of why this is really hard, uh, but it is really hard to make an electromagnetic accelerator to shoot something up 
to six or 700 kilometers per second of macroscopic particles. Uh, more reasonably, if you have the ship and the pellets each have half the velocity and traveling in opposite directions, you might be able to do this with clever trajectory using conventional means. Next slide. So if we start with a gravitational slingshot, we can drop that pellet dispensing spacecraft into a highly elliptical orbit that drops in very close to the sun and pre-positions the stream of pellets. Uh, then our spacecraft will follow the same orbit around the sun, but in the opposite direction. That gives you that double velocity. Uh, next slide. So the peak velocity, if you had a sun skimming orbit, would be pretty much the solar escape velocity, 617 kilometers per second. So you'd get uh, actually over a thousand kilometers per second with that head-on velocity. That's comfortably above that 650 kilometers per second uh, impact fusion threshold. You might ask the question, wow, how do you get down uh, really into the inner corona uh, of the sun? But turns out uh, Solar Probe Plus has given us a lot of confidence that we can get in too close to the sun. And there's been quite a few NIAC projects looking at getting even closer to the sun. Uh, the trick there is basically very, very reflective materials with high emissivity. So once the reaction would be ignited, the spacecraft would accelerate into the pre emplaced uh, pellet stream and head out of the solar system. Uh, next slide. So here's the final slide, uh, the bottom line, and this is how you would launch that. You would launch your system from Earth. Uh, before you've launched it, the pellets have already been put in place. You do a Jupiter swing by, gives you a gravity slingshot into that sun grazing orbit. You drop in close to the sun. Uh, you hit uh, the pellets that are going 617 kilometers per second in the opposite direction. And then you accelerate right along that runway under fusion power. Uh, so, Maybe Boussard's impossible dream was not so impossible. After all, we can get to the stars by collecting fuel along the way. Uh, we just have to put the fuel in place uh, before we start. Of course, some engineering details remain. So let's get working on it. Thank you. Thank you. So first question, how does the architecture and shape of a Bussard buzz bomb spacecraft differed from a Bussard ramjet? The difference is that, well, the difference is nobody knows how to make a Bussard ramjet, uh, but the main difference is we don't need the scoop uh, because the pellets are small. So we're not trying to grab a whole bunch of diffuse uh, material. Uh, we just have tiny little pellets that we need to hit. So it would look like a flying stovepipe. The engine itself would be very little more uh, than just a long pipe with magnetic fields inside to hold on to the plasma once you ignite it. Uh, there's actually a beautiful artist conception, but I wasn't sure if I had, had uh, permission from the artist to use it. So I didn't, uh, didn't grab it. I didn't have time to uh, go dig up the artist. Uh, but think of it as a flying stovepipe. Thank you. Here's a question. Isn't most of the mass in the boron which you have to carry? Yes. Uh, well, doesn't matter which one you carry. And turns out once you have the impact, uh, it doesn't matter whether the boron hit the hydrogen or the, the hydrogen hit the boron. So you'd have to do some useful calculations as to the optimum ratio, uh, but you carry the, the faster you go, the more you can let the boron be emplaced uh, and the less you have to actually carry. So as you start out, it has to be about 50-50. But as you go faster and faster, you can have more of it uh, in the pellet runway and less of it that you're carrying. But yes, it's true. This is not a zero fuel vehicle. It is a less fuel vehicle. Thank you.
And I think we're time. So, uh, Jeff, we hope to see you next time in person. Thanks. I hope to be there in person, too. Thank you. <laughs>